about me, God. This is about the church. And he's like, yeah, uh, they need to know uh, what you need to know. And so I found strength in that, the reality that most of the time when I experience life a certain way, the reality is most of you probably experience life a little bit the same way. And so although my messages never go quite the way I'd envision them going, when I started thinking through what am I going to talk about, God usually has a pretty good plan. And he begins to put that in, in place. The other thing I say as a disclaimer, you know, because sometimes when we let the Spirit of God speak to us, it's a little bit painful. And it can hurt and it can be frustrating a little bit and it can be challenging. So I leave you with this. What the Spirit may speak to you in the next 30 minutes, he's been beating me over the head with for the last two weeks. <laughs> so take that with a grain of salt, I guess. But, uh, but I, I do want to say as well here this morning, thank you so much for, to the worship team for their, for their leading and, and those songs. And one of the things that I, was, that I was struck with, as you've all seen in your sermon notes probably already, the title is Living Humble. But the first thing we need to realize, how can I ever get to living humble if I don't start with recognizing the greatness and the majesty and the amazing power of God? How can I ever reach a place of, of confessing my own shortcomings if I don't begin with the greatness of God? Because without the greatness of God, there's only the greatness of me. Now, I, uh, as, as, uh, as we get into things here, I've heard several prayers already for, for uh, you know, Pastor Taylor and stuff. And though, although I'm not Pastor Taylor, I am Jason Siebert. You know, so we got the Jason part right there. And, and I'm very glad to be a Siebert. Uh, it's, it's, obviously, it's who I am. Being a Siebert is a good thing. Being a Siebert, and my wife is probably downstairs because that's where we uh, usually worship, and uh, she's probably laughing already right now uh, because being a Siebert means a lot of things. Number one, you know, as most of you have gotten to know me, be being a Siebert means you're loud. I'm sorry. They give me a microphone so they can record, but we could just as well put this mic in the back for all that matters. But uh, being a Siebert means you're loud. It just is. You know, if you want to be heard in a Siebert household, you have to be loud, and, and you have to be louder than all the rest. But some good things, being a Siebert means relationship with God, and, and very dedicated relationship with God. In my family, I, I, have, I have three siblings. My dad is a pastor. My uh, younger sister is married to a man who's a vice president in a Christian university. My younger brother is, uh, is a pastor, and both me and my twin brother are elders and leaders in the churches that we're a part of. Praise God. That, that is a great, a great heritage, and, and then we get to hand that down, Lord willing, we get to pass that on. Being a Siebert also means that we're hard workers. From the very time I was... First out raking the leaves or doing whatever we could do with my dad, we learned to work hard. And we learned to get the job done. And as my kids can tell you, my, my motto when I have them out working with me is do it right the first time. Because I will call you back as many times as it takes. Do it right the first time. That's a good thing about being a Siebert. We work hard. We get the job done. We're highly relational. I love talking with people. I love, I can pick up a conversation and start talking with just about anybody. Now, to some of you, that's rather daunting. Thank you, Edna, for, for your candor this morning about how, how nervous you were. You won't believe this, but the first time I ever spoke in public was at a speech meet, and I was doing a reading thing. So actually, I was just reading this, this passage, and my right leg was shaking so hard I had to stand on that leg so I wouldn't shake. It's hard to believe I, I now can stand up here and speak and stuff, but, but I love talking. I love being relational with people. It's a great thing about being a Siebert. And these are things that my dad, my siblings were all the same. My, my mom, she married into the Siebert family, and so she had to learn some of those things. But, uh, but she's, she's that way as well. It, it's amazing. It's, it makes life so enjoyable when relationships are easy. We're good athletes. We're easygoing. 
lots of wonderful things. And now at this point, I, I told my wife a couple of weeks ago, she asked, what are you going to talk on? And I said, God's really been laying on me to talk about humility. Boy, did she laugh. <laughs> because to be a Seabird means you are incredibly proud and arrogant. Being a seabird, although we have all these great things I believe are, are, are fabulous and I love being, being a seabird means that I am incredibly proud and arrogant. And I get that from my dad and I get that from my grandpa and I assume it goes well beyond that as well. That's being a seabird. So though I've got a lot of good things in my life, one of, one of my biggest struggles is against, is against the pride and arrogance of of who I am. And one of the trouble with being a, a, an arrogant person is that I'm always playing the compare game and evaluating my performance against somebody else's performance. And if it doesn't quite add up, there's one of two things that happens. Either one, that's really not an important thing to be comparing anyway, so who really cares about that? Or number two, find a way to bring you down so that even though I'm not as good, I still look better. Those are really the only two options when you're trying to live life as a proud and arrogant person and someone is actually better than you. Either that thing doesn't matter or they're really not as great as it seems. And it's a life of bondage to performance. I'm not quite sure right now how we're going to get through everything that God's been speaking to me. So uh, unfortunately, unless Pastor Taylor says that I can have the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to be going for a long time here this morning. No, I'm just kidding. We'll try and keep things moving because although we always want to give time for the Spirit of God to move, I've also said there's nothing that says the Spirit of God can't move in 30 minutes. And let's pray for that right now because I do. I want to be brief. I want to be succinct. And yet we want to hear from the Spirit of God. And so, Heavenly Father, I just pray right now that by your Spirit, you would speak to our hearts. That you would, you would work in my mind and through my mouth the words that you want to come out. And that you would speak to our hearts the message that you want us to hear, that you want us to learn this morning. Your Word is perfect. Your Word is true. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Despite the fact that, that I live in a constant struggle of performance, I believe that I can have confidence in who I am when I am living humble. And I want to take us through a number of things. I'm not going to read all these passages. You can look in your concordance. You can look up the word humble, humility, whatever, and find all kinds of things. But I want to point out a few things here, first of all. Of, of why this is important. Besides the fact, like I said, I, I really don't want to be caught in this rat race. I, I don't. I hate it. It drives me crazy sometimes. But the reality is that when we look at Scripture, God says a lot of things about the proud and the humble. And I just want to, I just want to list out a few of these things to get us, get us started here. God can humble the proud. He can do it. The Scripture says that pride comes before destruction. The proud will be brought low. The pride of men will be humbled. God humbles the inhabitants of the height. He brings low the mighty. Now, another passage I want to look at, and, and we're going to look at a passage here in, chap in Daniel chapter 4 here. King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest kings in all the history of the world, he conquers the Israelites. He takes them off into captivity. He builds the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of, the, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And if we have that Daniel passage here, and it says in Daniel 4.37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything He does is right, and all His ways are just. And those who walk in pride, He is able to humble. Just before this passage, Nebuchadnezzar is in his palace and he says, look at all I've made. And God says, Nebuchadnezzar, this is all going to be taken from you. And at that very moment, simply by the will of God, Nebuchadnezzar became in his mind like an animal. And they drove him out of the city where he ate grass like a cow 
His hair grew long, his nails grew long, and he lived like an animal for seven years until he chose to humble himself, as that verse said. And he, ex he realized, you can bring low, it doesn't matter how great I am, you bring low the mighty, you humble those who are proud. God can do those things. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Here is something that's a, that's a struggle for me because I'm a Christian. I, I love God. I believe in him with all my heart. I want to live for him. I, I never want to fight against him. Yet every time I set myself up in, in pride and arrogance, I am setting myself up in opposition to the kingdom of God in favor of the kingdom of Jason. Every time I try to build myself up on my own, I am setting myself in opposition to the things of God. Obviously, that's, that's not a place I want to be. I want to have the blessing of God. I don't want to be opposed to him. And yet over and over and over, I'll be working and God will give me a great thought to, to, to do or to say or to pray. And it takes about a half second. I'll have the thought. And by the time the thought is complete, I'm already thinking of how I can come out looking good at the end of this. It's not what I want. God, I don't want, I'm building myself up in opposition to God. I, that's not the place I want to be. I want to have the confidence of living humbly for him and trusting that God can exalt those who are humble. In Luke chapter 14, and I'm not going to read this whole passage. Basically, Jesus is saying, he tells us, thing, if you go to somebody's house to a wedding, don't take the best seat because then they're going to come back and say, um, I'm sorry, we really need you to move down here. God humbles those who exalt themselves. Instead, Jesus says, instead, take a seat at the lowest place so that then they will come and say, oh, no, 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 don't sit down here. We're going to bring you up here because God exalts those who humble themselves. God exalts those who humble themselves. Some other things that God show that God can bless the humble it says that God rescues the humble. He leads the humble. He supports the humble. He, sup he crowns the humble with victory. God cares for the humble. He's gracious to the humble. To the humble, God does these things. Not to the Seberts. To the humble. I don't know if you've ever been praying for God to lead you. To give you direction. God leads the humble. I don't know if you've ever been asking that God would bring his presence to be with you. If we can go to Isaiah chapter 57. This is, this is incredible, this passage. This is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives for, forever and whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place but also with him who is contrite and lowly. That word can also be translated humble in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to, to revive the heart of the contrite. You want God's presence in your life? God says, not only am I the God of the mountains, the God of heaven and earth, I am the God who lives with the humble. Too often I set myself in opposition to the things of God because I want to build up myself. And God says, I live with the humble. I'm with them. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he might exalt you. Jesus, I want you to lift me up. But I too often get in my own way. I am often impatient with your timetable, and I want to be exalted here and now because I see if I want that next raise. 
If I want that promotion, I've got to put myself up there. I've got to be taking all the steps. And I'm not saying don't work hard for a promotion. But my issue is that I'm always trying to do the little things that get me a step ahead that make me look better. Whether I'm better or not, I want to look better. But God says, I will exalt the humble. I will lift you up at the right time. Sorry, Jason, it's not your time. It's my time, and it's the right time. I will lift you up. But to even begin there, I have to accept, as we sang about so many times this morning, the greatness and the majesty and the power of God. Or I can never trust that he is able to exalt those who humble themselves. Now, I've got a few things I want to say about being humble. But before I go to that, I want to say this because... Sometimes we just pray, God, make me humble. And it's very true that God can humble you. But being humbled by God is not the same thing as being humble. In the book of Exodus, God humbled Pharaoh over and over and over as he sent plague upon plague upon plague upon against Pharaoh. And each time Pharaoh humbled himself, he says, Moses, make it stop. Pray to your God, make it stop. But not one of those times did he humble himself. Get me out of the situation. But never did Pharaoh humble himself and acknowledge that God was greater than he was. Each time he sets himself up against God again. Being humbled by God does not make you humble. Another thing with that is uh, I keep trying to find something that says that God is just going to, to make this happen. But I, I've been looking through my Bible. In all the fruits of the Spirit, humility is not there. Galatians chapter 5. Spiritual gifts. And I know the list of spiritual gifts aren't, aren't exhaustive. But Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. Humility is not there. Over and over you see, humble yourself. It's not about God making me humble. It's about me choosing to accept the things of God and acknowledge that he is right. I, to, I take those things and I receive them in thanksgiving to God and I acknowledge that he is right. And then I can begin to move on to humility. These are some things that I found, and, and I find this, this, path, this message to be a little bit convoluted in my own mind because I've got different pieces, but I, I, I have to, for myself, establish I need humility. But what does that look like? What does that look like on a daily basis as I go throughout my day? What does it look like to be humble? Do I just let people run me over and that's good? Sure, run, run me down, then, then I'll be humble, you know? What does it look like to be humble? Because I, I've looked and looked for definitions and I can't find one that I truly like. So what I want to do is just take a few moments right now to look at some things in Scripture and what it looks like, what humility looks like in Scripture. And so we're kind of switching gears here. But first of all, in humility, five benchmarks of humility, which for someone like me puts it at a performance thing. I know, okay, i got to accomplish this and this and this benchmark and then I'm humble. Not quite. But these are some of those benchmarks, those checkpoints, those, those way to say, these are the things I need to, I need to show myself humble in. And that's the sense of the, the way I use that word benchmark. The first benchmark is I have to confess and repent. Confess and repent. Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. 1 John 1, 1.9. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just. And will forgive us our sins. But you know what? I have to confess. I have to acknowledge that God. I am wrong. And that what you say. Regardless of what anybody else says. Regardless of what makes sense. Regardless of what 
looks like it's the best move for me now, that you're still right. God, you're right. It's much easier when I can just be right by myself. But I have to acknowledge that God is right and that I am wrong. One of my greatest favorite passages about this is in Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel comes to God. They're in captivity because of the sin of Israel. And Daniel, he's the guy, if you read in chapter 9 and 10 of Daniel, the angel Gabriel comes and visits him and he says, Daniel, you are highly esteemed in heaven. Daniel, you are greatly loved. And it's not just the kind of love that God loves everyone, Daniel, and he loves you too. No, the angel is saying, Daniel, you are, a, you're amazing, Daniel, in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. God views Daniel as, as someone who is, is seeking after him. And yet in Daniel chapter 9, we see Daniel saying, God, I confess my sin. All the sins of Israel. Jesus, God, we've sinned. We've failed. We have brought shame on ourselves. Daniel identifies with the sin of Israel, even though he hasn't committed much of it. If we were to try and put them on a scale, there's Israel and there's Daniel. And Daniel identifies with it all. Too often I try to say, well, I'm not as bad as them. Well, look at them. This is my whole performance thing again, right? Look at them, God. You really don't have to worry about me. I'm really doing pretty good. God says, I don't care how good you are or how bad they are. You've got junk in your life, Jason. And you need to humbly confess and repent of that sin. Confess and repent. I have to acknowledge that what God says is right. No matter how I compare to anybody else, I have to accept that what God says is right. And confess my sin. Number two, I have to embrace weakness. Like I said for myself, if I'm not better than you at something, it's because number one, it doesn't matter, or number two, there's really something else going on and you're not as great as you thought, think you are, right? But God says, you need to embrace weakness, Jason. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. I like hearing all the stuff about my spiritual gifts and my strengths and things like that, right? That's what we're, we've actually been conditioned in churches to focus on your strengths. Do what you do well, and I'm not opposed to that. But where do we ever come into the place and say, thank God for my weakness? Thank God that I'm not good at this, but since he's calling me, I'm going there anyways. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. You know, as a seabird, I work hard. And I am more than happy to put in the work to get to a point where I'm better at something than you are. All right? When I am weak, then I am strong. I have to build myself up in everything to make myself better than you. And yet Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And you know why? Because it's not me. I can't take credit for anything. It's all Jesus. And that's all that matters. Living humbles means I embrace my weaknesses. I embrace the fact, man, maybe, maybe talking is hard for you. This is not my weakness up here, talking. This is a strength of mine, I think. You might disagree at this point, but I think this is a strength of mine. I enjoy this. And again, Edna, thank you so much for coming and talking because so what if it's not your strength? Praise God that you can go and be a mouthpiece for him. Because when something good happens out of that, it wasn't you. If you come to me after the service and say, hey, great message, Jason, I'll say, yeah, thanks, I know. <laughs> Praise God. Because God has gifted me, but 
praise God for the gift, and I want to use it well. But when something good happens, it's so much easier to take the credit. When I act out of weakness, there is no credit. When the Midianites came against Israel in the book of Judges, Gideon, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of Midians, and Gideon gets together an army of several thousand people. This looks horrible. I think it was a little over 20,000. And God says, that's too many. And Gideon's thinking he's got to be, wait a minute, God, 20,000 versus 150,000, you're saying we've got too many? And God whittles it down till it's only 300 men. When I am weak, then I am strong. And now God says, now go. Now we're at the right place for me to work. And Gideon goes, and Gideon and those 300 men are victorious against the entire Midianite army. Why? Because Gideon was an incredible genius on the battlefield? There is no genius for 300 against 150,000. It is only because of the work of God. And as a church, when we want to live humble, we need to embrace our weaknesses. We need to embrace the fact that we're not good at everything. We need to embrace the fact that we make mistakes and we fall short because only then can God get the glory. We talked this morning about some people who are going, who are serving in a closed creative access country. Talk about being in a place of weakness. We have friends who are either in other closed access countries right now or looking to go there. Talk about going to a place of weakness. You're going to do a job which you can't talk about, either to the people you're working with or the people who you hope to have supporting you. Talk about a place of weakness. And yet when great things happen, God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. Third is that we need to know ourselves. We need to know ourselves. Yes, we, we need to embrace weakness, but we need to understand who we are. In Romans chapter 12 here, Paul says, By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than, than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. This isn't saying that I need to run myself into the dirt about everything. I can acknowledge that God has given me good things, that God has given me strengths, as well as the weaknesses that I have. It's taking all of that together and taking a real look at it. A real look at it. Not one where I have to build myself up or where I have to tear myself down. But acknowledging, God, this is who you've made me to be. And by the grace of God, I, I give it to you, God, that you make all you can out of me. God, use me. Use my strengths. Use my weaknesses. We need to take a realistic look at ourselves. Acknowledge your weaknesses while giving glory to God for your strengths. Now, this is the part that I really can get into. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, Ah, you see all these other disciples? I worked harder than all of them. I like that. I like that part. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God in me. So I am so proud of the fact that I can outwork you, that I can out-hustle you. That's what it was in basketball when I was a teenager. I was not big of the biggest. I was not the most talented, but I would outwork and out-hustle absolutely anybody on the court. And I used to be very, very proud of the fact that even though I wasn't as good as you, I would still beat you because I worked harder. And Paul just throws that all away for me. He says, it wasn't me. It was the grace of God inside me. Did you know that your work ethic is not from you? It's not from your parents. It's not from your grandparents. It's none of those things. It's by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I am who I am. That's living humble when I can accept that I work hard. But praise God. Not me. Praise God. 
Fourth is to value others. There are some people I know. Our, our kids have, uh, have these, they're called CASA workers, and they are incredible at valuing other people. They are amazing encouragers who lift your spirits to be around them. And you know what? They never talk about the great things that they do. They, they come to me and Ann, and they're like, oh, you guys do such a great job. And our kids are probably thinking, yeah, you didn't see them yesterday. <laughs> but they encourage us, and they build us up, and they say things to us that just, they lift your spirits. That is shum being humble. That is saying, hey, you matter. You don't need to worry about me. You matter. In fact, uh, Philippians chapter 2, so we'll skip that first verse there. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Consider others better than yourself. I, I'm, I'm pretty good at, well, when I want to be, I can be an encourager. I will encourage you. I will say, hey, great job, way to go. Good game if it's sports, great message, great talk. Oh, I love your testimony and everything. Now you want to hear what I've done, right? I'll build you up, but there's a side to this, because now we're going to talk about Jason for a little while. You're great, but now hear about my greatness. In humility, consider others more important than yourself. This is something that I desperately want to be better at. All these things are, but this is the one that really is the clincher for me, Value others. Value others. They're important. Care for them. Love them. Encourage them. Talk about them. Consider others more important than yourself. That's living humble. That's, that's Jesus. When we follow his example, he had everything. He's the God of the universe. And yet he came down to us. Not to show us, not, not like LeBron James going and playing basketball with a bunch of kindergartners so that they can see how amazing he is. He came down to us so that we could come up and have a relationship with God. Living humble. The fifth one, and this isn't so much about living humble, but it's about the reality of humility. Colossians 3.12. Well, let me just find it then. Oh, there. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Now, there's the fruit of the Spirit, which God's Spirit works in you, if you have Him in your life. Here, Paul says, clothe yourselves, put it on. You wake up, woke up this morning, you went to your closet, you selected certain things that you were going to put on today, right? Or maybe you didn't. Maybe you just stumbled around blindly and pulled a few things out, and here you are. But most of us, we look at what am I going to put on today? And we, and we put on things that are going to make us look good, right? I don't, I don't go through and think, oh, this stuff looks hideous. I think I'll wear it. We, we want things that are going to make us look good. But Paul says here, clothe yourselves, put on compassion, kindness, and humility. Over and over, the Bible doesn't say, look at these who God has made humble. It says, he exalts those who humble themselves, who put on humility each day. I want to put it on. I have to choose to put it on. Humility doesn't make itself in me automatically. And I've learned very throughout my life, humility doesn't hardly come into my play for me much at all. I have to choose it. I have to put it on. When I get up in the morning, I have to say, God, 
I am looking to choose humility every step of the way. I have to put it on. It doesn't automatically come. It's intentional. It's purposeful. It's willful that I will put on humility. Five benchmarks of humility. Being willing to confess and repent of our sins. Being willing to embrace my weaknesses. Accept the fact that I fall short. Three. Knowing myself and giving God the glory. Knowing myself. Four, to value others. And five, that every day I want to put it on. I want to take humility and I want to put it on. I want to wear it and I want it to show to everyone around me. Not so they can say, oh, Jason, what a humble guy but so that I can lift them up and show value to them and benefit other people and in my weakness be used by God. Living humble. Unfortunately, it's such a far cry from living Siebert, but I pray that by the grace of God, those two might at some point be more synonymous with each other. And I pray the same thing for you. That this week, as as we go from here, this afternoon, the coming week, as you see situations choosing by the grace of God to live humble with the people around you. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the greatest example of humility. who you are, yet what you gave up to become the greatest sacrifice we could ever imagine. Lord, we pray that by your grace we would see opportunities for humility this week. And as a result, we would allow you to work in our lives. To grow that humility in us. And that we would trust you to raise us up at the right time. God, there are so many other things we can say. But Lord, we trust you as the great, the magnificent, the almighty, the all-knowing, the all-powerful God, that you will do what is best. And we humbly trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have a a new song that we want to um, do with you. Amy brought my attention to it, and uh, it was so appropriate for this week. Um, This week I had to sit on jury duty. Ugh. Um, I don't thank God for our lawyers and our judges who, um, it is amazing to see our court system uh, working. But it was... Um, it just made you sick to hear how people are living. And, and I know that, I mean, I work with a lot of that, but to sit and listen to testimony and you just, you just want to cry out, you know, if you would give your heart to Christ and live for him, you would not be living in this filth, but they're lost. I mean, there, there was every single element of this case was just sad. And um, Thursday, after we were done, I called Bill in and he said, do you want to come and 
watch the kids swim because I could watch my kids do events 24-7. And I said, you know what, I just want to go home and have God wrap his arms around me and just have, <laughs> see, I told you. Um, I just need to feel him. I just need to know that he has this, that he has these people in that and that things will change. Um, he was my refuge. And I, and then and I shared this Thursday night, which was a huge blessing for me. This team um, worked so well together Thursday night. Um, and talking to some of them, they have been through the ringer too. And I know um, we've had stuff in our school this week, a uh, hard week. And I know people out there have had a horrible hard week. So I think God brought this song to Amy for a lot of us. Um, and it's called Refuge. It's kind of fast. I think my grandma would roll her eyes at me. Um, maybe not roll her eyes, but I would know she wasn't really feeling it. But um, so even if it's not your tempo, I would pray you look at the words because he is our refuge. That's, that's what is so amazing as having Christ as your savior is that, yeah, you're going to go through things and you're going to hear things, but you have a refuge. You have a peace. You have him, as my kids used to say, this is probably old by now, but they used to say, he's got your back. And um, people who don't know him don't have that, and they go through it by themselves. Strong as yours for me. 